Okay, we're back live at VMworld 2012 Day 2. This is theCUBE, SiliconAngle.tv's extensive coverage of VMworld. We go out to the events and we extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org and we're here with Chad Sackich, who's the Senior Vice President of EMC, longtime CUBE alum, friend of the CUBE. Great to see you again. Guys, Dave, awesome. John, it's great to be here again. Another VMworld, I mean, you know, I have to say, so I go back a couple of years ago, two or three anyway, we yep. were talking and you were laying out some vision. I remember the, the chalk talk session that we had about abstracting complexity and you know, just, we're going to do to, to storage and networking what we did to compute. And now you're hearing that vision you know, really come to fruition. Was I right? Yeah, well, you're, you're, <laughs> the direction is very clear, right? The record. So I, my question is really, are we, you know, we're there with, with storage, like we're making a lot yep. of good progress there. You're seeing some major action going on in networking, but yeah, I think in general you were right on. So you got to feel good about that. You there's really still, had a good grasp of where it was going. There's still a lot to do. Yeah, clearly. Right? So, um, you know, the, the software defined data center is partially about where value moves. It's mostly about where policy is controlled, but it's also about decoupling control planes from infrastructure, right? So in storage land, we're done pretty well in terms of the policy moving up to SDRS, storage I.O. control, policy communication with stuff like Vasa and things like that. But um, one thing that is still not right in storage land is the, uh, the fact that the control plane for storage is always embedded in the storage target. So there's, there's still work to do and there's lots and lots of cool stuff for future EMC worlds and VM worlds, but you can see insane progress. Well, you just wrote about VM, VM granular storage. Yep. That's kind of exciting, gave us a few hints there. Uh, and well, <laughs> so that was top, top secret last year, right? And we were working on engineering prototypes at the time. Uh, we weren't really allowed to say much about it. And then, um, you know, basically I saw Duncan Epping, one of my buddies at VMware, do a blog post on it. And then VJ, who did the session, posted it. And I'm like, okay, I guess it's wide Fair open. Games. So I uh, did the post. That will change the game in storage, and I'll tell you, it is consuming one of the largest proportion of our engineering roadmap for future years to come across everything that we're doing. Talk a little bit about why that will change the game, help people understand So, um, this is a bit of a weird idea, so it takes a little bit, it's like quantum physics, you kind of have to forget what you know, <laughs> right? Um, basically, today, data stores, whether it's on block or NAS, is a bad construct for virtualization because it means that the policy at the storage layer is always in a container where the container contains multiple VMs and all of the VMs have that policy, whatever it is, right? If we want to get to this software-defined storage world, the storage infrastructure, whatever it is, would need to be able to enforce policy on a VM by VM basis, not fake it. NAS devices can kind of fake it today by doing file level snapshots, file level replicas but literally the storage array would need to operate in something that would be a VM or a VApp level of granularity, something that's called a VVOL. The other reason that it's problematic is that managing these environments at scale involves managing thousands and thousands of LUNs or file systems, which is a pain. So there's something that's called an IOD multiplexer, a name that only an engineer could love, which basically <laughs> is like the IO path for everything, regardless of the number of VMs. It means that in the few today, the way storage policy works for VMware is they pick what data store you place and then they move the VM to try to meet the policy. Ideally, what would happen is VMware as the policy layer would say, this is the policy I need for this VM, you figure it out, and then you're the one that if you need to make a change internally to keep that policy coherent, do it. You can get to it from any available path. Right. Uh, Chad, okay. so Chad, yeah, that's I, not I want to get your perspective <laughs> on something, because you're in the, in the trenches, but also you got that unique ability as an executive to kind of see the big picture and the kind of the 20 mile stare. Uh, Pat was just on talking about the, um, the convergent infrastructure demo HP was doing, yep. and yesterday they laid out the old way, new way, you know, old servers to cloud, you know, old apps to new apps with big data, PCs to mobile, et cetera, et cetera. So the question for you is, I want to get mm -hmm. your perspective on if converged infrastructure is all considered old, which I believe it is, because it's been defined many, many years ago, yeah. um, and you now factor in that data, data, dealing with data, big data and all aspects of data, moving data around, all aspects of that relative to storage, define data infrastructure as a way to talk about it as a modern converged infrastructure. What's different about the new data infrastructure if I want to make the statement that data infrastructure is the converged, modern version of converged? 
Yep. Given, given the, the, the market force of splash, storage, and the stuff you were mentioning. Yep. So, uh, first things first, today's definition of converged infrastructure of integrated server network and storage hardware stacks um, is really about just getting people to spend less time on the stuff that doesn't matter, right? That's, it's, that, it, it has nothing to do with the individual architectures of a good server or a bad server or the individual architectures of uh, you know, the right storage design or the wrong storage design. It's literally stop paying attention to the noise, move on to something deploying, de deploying something that matters, right? Yeah. Um, and you saw the HP demonstration, which I thought was cool, but hey, we did UIM demos you know, a couple years back and, and so on and so forth. What is changing is these new requirements at the storage layer are coming in a couple of different uh, forms. The first form is uh, when customers need Swiss Army knives, because they're small and that's the only infrastructure they're going to have for storing all their data, their small data, their big data, their NAS, their block, their object. Architectures that are simple, easy to consume, buy, transact, go through the channel, those are the things that are winning today and they're going to win tomorrow. Because of the packaging and simplicity. Packaging, simplicity, and their, their general purpose, right? Um, and I think you can expect to see continued growth of things that look like hybrid arrays, you know, that have Swiss Army knife-like functions, um, and VNX, you know, is EMC's answer in that market, right? And VNXE. But what we're finding is as soon as a customer uh, w has the uh, requirements that says, I, I'm okay with not Swiss Army knife, right? I, I want a design for purpose. A immediately, <laughs> immediately they diverge into, into three different architectural mo models that are just totally different. And you can take the EMC product name. Where data is critical. Right. Um, and it's a, a sufficient scale to warrant this. Um, they need it for transactional systems where all of a sudden the all flash world uh, starts to become very, very important, right? And what we saw is we saw that the requirements, by the way, in all three of these categories is that scale out is a fundamental design construct. So. Basically in transactional systems, scale out models that increasingly, and step by step by step, will move towards all flash models, just intrinsically based on technology, uh, will come to dominate. And, and we looked at it and we, th we saw that Extreme IO was, in our opinion, the best technology out there, right? And um, you could buy. That's, that's right, <laughs> or, or that existed, right? So we're doing demos here that show, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of IOPS, all doing inline dedupe, all things that you just could never do if you didn't build it in. Okay, so let's right? talk about Flash, because I want to interrupt a second. Le very briefly, okay. John, right? So that's category one. The second category is the scale out NAS. Scale out NAS is the fastest growing category of storage infrastructure that's in this space, and you can see us and others battling it out furiously in that space. Right? Isilon is growing faster than we can <laughs> manage it. Like our biggest problem is how do we grow our, our resource, our channel, and all that stuff. But the third category that is also scale out in its nature is basically um, analytics storage, right? Whether it's unstructured with Hadoop or whether it's structured, massively parallel DAS systems, right? So each one of those is solving a very unique and different architectural problem, but they've got these fundamental characteristics of scale out, built on commodity parts, software based, and their yeah, yeah. characteristics are suit to need. I totally agree with you. Uh, and, and would ask, and it's causing a lot of confusion. First of all, those are legit use cases and architectural constructs. Now the question now, because we're coming back down to the old days of interoperability conversations, integration support. So the question is, is that it seems to be, everyone's definition seems to be different because their architecture is different because of their environment. Are you seeing any new, uh, is that true? Do you see, this data infrastructure, mm. and, and how does that d make data infrastructure different than just saying, <laughs> hey, I'm buying some conversion infrastructure? So what's interesting is these architectural models flow from their use cases. Check, agreed, 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 yes, like, right? Yeah, sure. But what is unfortunate is that there's not a decoupled control plane. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some sort of like, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> uh, abstraction layer that would not just be for EMC stuff, and not just for these three categories of transactional block, scale out NAS, and by the way, the transactional block is, is scale out in nature, and the scale out NAS use cases, and even these object storage models. Wouldn't it be cool 
there really needs to be like an open flow of storage in a yeah, sense. Yeah, some sort of software solution policy some, based. Yeah, perhaps. Sort of homogeneous but a, but a top down data management oh, da strategy. Come on, and, and, but the thing is, is that it has, it has to not mess with the data path. It needs to be control okay. path only. So oh, I'll just jump in and throw a, uh, uh, a wrench into the equation here. So HP ships an open flow hardware device in their quote converged infrastructure. We yep. have Bethany Mayer who leads that networking group. And they have a converged infrastructure group. They're organized beautifully around the old convergence. But yet no one talks about open flow on HP. I think they're the only ones shipping a product. Is that because it's not relevant in the architecture? Uh, I, so I think, um, as I was writing the blog post from last night, I was thinking to myself, you know, it's funny, people will look at everything and, and um, analyze it. And analyze it. And, you know, like for example, uh, you know, VMware's doing some tech previews of things called vSAN. EMC's doing previews of things that cannibalize our other thing, you know, and everyone always wants to jump to the conclusion of like, okay, who's eating someone. who and who's doing what, and, but, and it's fun drama to watch. And it's fun, it's exciting, it's IT, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but what but there's a relevance miss, equation though. Well, people, what people miss is the biggest hazard for any company isn't that, yeah. uh, that you get eaten by somebody else, it's that somehow you lose your mojo and your willingness to cannibalize yourself and innovate, et cetera, et cetera. And the challenge usually is related to your business. If your existing business revenues are over here, it's very difficult to go and say, I'm going to eat myself with this thing over here. Um, one thing that is very interesting is as we do this, there's value that moves all over the place. We launched yeah. this VDP thing, right, which will no doubt eat some of the low end of Avamar's business, but that's okay and it's all good, right? I think that in the case of the HP thing, they need to make that team literally have a charter that says your job is to kill the old way. Yeah, not just a feature. It's not a feature, your job is to kill the old way. And you know, set up some... Well, successful companies eat their own yeah. before the competition does. That's you know, clearly, you know, and Oracle decided to take a different approach. They just kind of protect. Um, this whole nother, now there's no I, story, I, but... I, just, um, I think it's, Joe said it, Joe, you know, Joe's a man who's just a fountain of genius quotes, Tucci, <laughs> right? He, he basically said the single you know, defining characteristic of all the companies that die in each one of these technology waves is they are playing a defensive game, right? So I, I'm not going to tell Larry Ellison what to do. He owns an island. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> um, so clearly he's doing something right. He's like a telco. Um, Protect your territory, extract rents out of the ecosystem. I, you know, there's probably people inside Oracle going, these in-memory database models, these NoSQL database models, Cassandra, all this stuff, we've got to get in there. And someone within Oracle, hopefully for their sake, is saying, yes, we will protect you from the natural organizational tendency to... Or maybe they're saying Hadoop is snake oil. Yeah, right, you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. Boy, what's the big disruptor that you're seeing right now? I mean, we got, I know time's getting tight here, but I want to ask a couple of questions around um, just observational chats. So you know, no one will take read into it other than just your your genius. Um, <laughs> but, like, come but, on, um, man. Share with us your observations of what you see disrupting out there. What's you know just the Chad view of you know what points of disruption you see in some smoke, where you see fire uh, going on today in the market. Uh, biggest disruptors I see over and over again are totally new data models, totally new application models far out and away, like, look, there's disruption in the world of flash and storage, enormous, right? There's disruption with SDN and networking, enormous, right? There's disruption of OpenStack entering into the market and, and gaining steam, right? And you can see uh, VMware responding this week, in my opinion, you know, uh, looking at, at VMware from an outsider, responding to changes that they're seeing in the market, embracing that. Dynamic Ops, yeah, the Sierra, yeah. and others, mm -hmm. right? But far and away, when I talk to customers, the thing that really basically changes their business is when they have new data models, and that, that's partially like database models, it's partially big data and analytics, and as they, they entirely build new apps using new app frameworks, that changes the game entirely. In some cases, it doesn't necessitate traditional storage, virtualization at all. So my question, the next one is more organizational, like around the industry, because you yep. had uh, the experience in following your career of doing a lot of integration work with VMware as yep. part of the EMC team. So you've seen under the hood, you've worked with the players, you're in the ecosystem, um, not only personality, but also as a, as, a, as a technical person and executive. So you've worked with the VMware you know, machinery. Yep. Um, so, okay, here's the premise. VMware's growing like a weed, 
They're expanding beyond the VMware focus of just I would VMware. Say more like a flower. Like a flower, <laughs> more like a beanstalk. Um, um, so, so now they're going multi-vendor, they're embracing obviously the partnerships, and we're seeing their moves like Nasira and some of the other things that are just, like Joe says, rapid disruption. What's your advice to people like VCE, like NetApp, other, other vendors and other startups that have to kind of make quick decisions around how to adjust to VMware? Is there any advice, observations you can share with them? Because obviously, when you make moves like Nasira, it changes the game on the whole architecture, because now you have a, an emerging software component, yep. policy-based, blah, 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 and you know, VCE is more of a high-end thing. VCE in particular has to make some, you know, just some tweak their positioning, change their messaging, yeah. you know, do those kinds um, of things. So, That's a very good question. Um, I think that the reality of it out there, right, is that every technology company is looking out for their customers, because if you don't look out for your customers, something's going to go horribly wrong. They're looking out for their shareholders, and they're looking out for themselves. That Those are all like one little idea package, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, they got to make their moves. And, and they need to, each company needs to think about what is in my strategic short-term, long-term, you know, interest. Um, and that's just a fact. I'm not saying anything that's earth shattering there, right? Um, I will say that VMware has got a track record of creating shifts in the industry that represent, to some degree, terrifying changes to the old, but turned out time and time again to represent huge opportunity, huge triggers of innovation, uh, but they're not surprising anyone. If you're, if you're in the know, it's yeah. pretty obvious. They know what the so maps are. The, the trick, though, is that when you first find out about something that, is, uh, that you look at and you go, wow, this is, this is going to have some impact. If they're successful with X, it's going to impact something Y, and that's going to that's cause some uh, disruption to my little company ball of customer, shareholder, self-interest, yeah. right? You can either curl up and and fight, and that could be a winning strategy. It hasn't proven to be a winning strategy to date, right? Or all of us have to basically uh, out-innovate. And don't get me wrong, VMware's got companies that are trying so to basically out basically, to summarize, you put your running shoes on and keep up. Ke totally, Basically. Man. Totally. Nail your value proposition, make your tweaks you need to do, and, and keep your running shoes on or be left behind. And accept that basically the only constant has changed. The things that, you know, were your core value proposition at some point may not be your core value proposition tomorrow. So today, there's a set of value proposition that leads more customers to choose EMC for VMware than anyone else. Great. How will those change over the next two or three years? They will change. How has the community changed? Here's a, here's a question for you, because you, you can get some insight on this one. How has the community of VMware, VMware ecosystem changed over the past 24 months, 12 months, and how do you see it evolving? Obviously it's growing, so that's one factor. New, new, new entrance, new migration of people coming in. Um, yeah. So how would you see, what's changed and where, is, where do you think it's going to be going? Someone actually asked me this uh, online. They said, uh, you know, now that, now that VMware's the you know, 800 pound gorilla, you know, they're no longer cute and cuddly and like <laughs> fight the man, and they are the man. How'd that happen? Stick it to EMC. Right. Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the thing that I, I responded with is the community around VMware, and here I'm not just talking about the vendor and partner community, I mean the community the community. People, the, the people, the people, the real people. Um, they, they gravitate towards VMware, to VMUGS, to VMworld, because it's really cool and great technology. Because it's helping them with their business, and because the community is a self-fulfilling thing. So long as VMware can keep cool, cool technology that's helping people with their business, the third one of a community that is self-fulfilling will keep happening. I mean, VMUGs are bigger now and more interactive and more intimate now than I've seen them before. Mm. Yeah, um, they have their own governance in a way. People do stupid stuff at VMworld like those reserved for Chad Sackatch <laughs> things. And BJ Jenkins, you know, I'm going to come and I'm going to get you, man. I'm going to get you, BJ, right there. Um, but, uh, you know, this place is fun. I mean, like, I don't know whether you guys feel the same way, but uh, this is one of the most fun, dynamic communities. I don't think that that is changing. I think it's solidifying. 
What would you say to the VMware employees that now inherit the greatness of Pat Gelsinger, who should do a great job, he's young, he's solid, he's got great experience, great knowledge, great technical knowledge. Uh, what would you share with the, the, the folks that watch this from that are employees I've, of VMware and their partners? I, I've had the great luxury of working with Pat from the first day that he uh, came to EMC. A funny story, I don't know how much time I've got, but I'll try to make it short because this is a gas. You know, I, you know Joe actually goes, you know, tap, tap, Chad, Pat's coming in, give him the brain dump on everything EMC. And I'm like, okay, great. So I sit down, I'm on the whiteboard, <laughs> I'm explaining it. And then he started to ask some questions that illustrate he had a fundamental lack of knowledge about the storage industry as a whole, <laughs> right? And I'm like, wow, this is, this is going to be funky, <laughs> right? Literally a week later, I'm back, and he's arguing about the code path <laughs> inside Ingenuity with Symmetrix engineering. So in the time span of one <laughs> week, right? He hit the books. He boom. <laughs> uh, Has he's, a quick study. He can keep up with us on theCUBE. That's one thing we know. He had that right? matrix program. Yeah, you know? <laughs> he's, he's an engineer's engineer. He accepts nothing uh, other than uh, uh, being the best. Yep. He's very passionate about that. He's very focused. And what I would say is, I think it's a, one of the best examples that I can think of in recent history about uh, exec transitions, right? So what VMware needed when Paul came in was a vision of where VMware could take the entire industry. And if you look back, what he said way back is basically still kind of directionally where we're going. It's gone through different names, cloud OS, you know, data center OS, you know, software uh, mainframe, software, main <laughs> software defined data center. It's always been this idea of abstract, pool resources, make them elastic, which allows people to focus on the stuff that's up higher, right? And then over the years, that included a lot of different strategy changes to expand into the app. The vFabric data director thing was a joint EMC and VMware project. Lots and lots of stuff like that, right? What's needed now is that focus on execution against vision. There's nobody mm. better in the world to do that than Pat Gelsinger. Okay, we have to cut it short with Chad. A um, small interview turns into a long, great content mm. machine. Guys, you, are, you are a content machine, whether you're doing <laughs> Chad's world, jumping out of airplanes, or just being uh, on the a great tech geek and a great executive. Great to have you on theCUBE, great to see John, you. John, it's great to be here. Hey, we'll be right yeah, back uh, with uh, Mark man. Egan from VMware. We're going to talk about uh, you know, what's going on at the CIO level, how these guys are rolling out, and you know, so they eat their own technology, they live it, they're use casing it, so we want to hear cutting edge stuff from VMware, inside the ropes at VMware. We'll be right back with Mark right after this short break. <laughs>